Return to Matthew chapter 6 this evening as we conclude our study of the disciples' prayer under the title, Worshiping God in Prayer. Let's just review the major points we've looked at so far. Uh, Get my clicker back on here. Verses 5 and 6, we were talking about the fact that prayer must be sincere, not the prayer of the hypocrite. And remember, it was talking about the hypocrite thinking he would be heard because of repetition, because of being seen by people, and yet none of this affects God's plan or God's uh, willingness to answer. Prayer is communication then, not manipulation. Many people have a wrong idea of what prayer should be or what its purpose is. And verses 7 and 8 help to form our thoughts in that regard as well, the matter of the repetition and knowing that God already knows what we need before we pray. That should not be a disincentive to prayer, but an encouragement when we do come in prayer that even if we present the request inadequately, that God still knows what needs to be done. And God is well able to meet that need. Verse 9, where the prayer actually begins, our Father who is in heaven, reminds us of the fact that prayer must be dedicated to God alone. And yes, there are those who pray to saints, even to deceased relatives. None of that can be effective. But it also is ineffective to pray to God if he's not your Father. So the fact of the fatherhood of God, we're not talking about the universal fatherhood of God, but rather the spiritual fatherhood that occurs as we trust Jesus Christ for forgiveness of our sin. And then in verse 10, a prayer that puts God's interests ahead of our own. We read there of God's kingdom coming and his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That brings us then to verse 11, which says, Give us this day our daily bread. This is the first petition that is in any way personal. The others were related to God's concerns, to God's interests. And this matter does highlight the fact that prayer may contain personal requests. It's essential that prayer contains some of the other ingredients we've been looking at, a proper recognition of who God is, so that God's program is more important to us than even what we think of as our daily needs. But there does come that moment when there are needs that need to have attention. And we're submitting those to God for his provision. This is the petition of daily provision for basic needs. Now, I put it in that way because there are many who try to expand this to include all sorts of things. And God does not promise to give us wealth, luxury, or selfish desires. And I know the misread of Psalm 37, what is it, verse 4, which says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. A verse very often lifted from its context, kicking and screaming, and twisted beyond recognition to mean in the perversion of our human minds that if I'll just put on a good religious facade, that God will give me everything I ask for. That's not at all what Scripture is saying. It's talking about the formation of our desires coming from a relationship with God, from knowing God personally. But God does commit himself to providing for basic needs. Now, though only food is mentioned here, it would also include, as we expand it throughout Scripture, things such as clothing, shelter, and other things that are legitimately characterized as needs. And I think most of us can distinguish between the things that we need and the things that we want. And that, again, flies in the face of what we said in, in the, what we visited in the introductory remarks, that prayer is not a wish list. It's not your Christmas list. Though it can contain 
personal needs. These should be limited to what is truly needed. Now, we can't expand that and ask for desires, but it's simply the fact that God does not commit himself necessarily beyond what is needed. And the one promise in Scripture that we have is that God does not abandon his own. And we'll look at Psalm 37, verse 25 in this respect in just a few moments. But as background to that, we need to understand that this concept of God's fatherhood, of those who truly trust in him, is used by Christ in one of the parable statements that he gives to his disciples, comparing God to a human father. And the conclusion is that if our human fathers know how to give us good things and respond to our needs, God certainly does know how to do the same thing. So God cares for his own, just like a good father cares for his children. And that's the connection that we have to have with God. Because if God is not our Father, God can choose to answer the prayer of an unbeliever. Yes? you believe that? Sure. I've heard plenty of evidence of that. But God does not obligate himself to answer the prayer of the unbeliever until it is the prayer of faith. As a side note of this, would it be wrong to teach a child, perhaps your own child or grandchild, to recite the Lord's Prayer as a model for prayer before they know Christ as Savior, before God is technically their Father? Would it still be right to teach them that and to help them say that? Of course it would. We're trying to prepare that heart so that they can come to God in faith. But again, the obligation that God places him under is specifically to his children. He is attentive to the cry of his children for help. And this brings us to Psalm 37, verse 25, where the psalmist says, I have been, I, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I remember when I was a young teenager over in Elizabethtown, not too far from here, the church that we were attending at that point, there was a young, uh, there was an older gentleman. I mean, he must have been, I, I thought he was 95 or so, or pretty close to Methuselah's age one way or another. He would always begin a testimony with these words. I have been young, now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That verse was indelibly, indelibly imprinted in my mind by that gentleman. I couldn't tell you his name if I tried. What a testimony. But that's the actual fact. Do you know what's interesting? I've used this verse to approach an individual that I found begging on the street who claimed that they were a child of God and because you know, I want to use it as a witnessing opportunity as well as trying to meet a physical need. And when they tried to tell me all about their relationship with God, I said, you know, there's something that's really troubling me right now. This is what God's word says. How is it you're in this position? What is there of disobedience that may have caused you to be in this situation? And usually uh, it's just a ruse. It's a person telling you that they know the Lord, though they really do not. But... Again, a verse that's instructive about the way God deals with his own. We can count on that. That doesn't mean we'll never miss a meal. The Apostle Paul missed many meals. That's the context of Philippians chapter 4. Two verses that are torn from context. We won't go into them really tonight, but verses 13 and 19. You can look at them later. They're in the context of great need and God's abundant provision. And that as well for us is something that we can count on. We may miss some meals here or there, but God's faithfulness will not cease. Now, verse 12 says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This, to me, is the hardest part of the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer as it's properly named. Because this requires something of me. And this isn't always easy because 
forgiving is not nearly as easy as being forgiven. You ever notice that? Just an observation. But think about the backstory of this verse that we are asking God to help us forgive others in the same manner in which we have been forgiven. To back that up and to give us some detail to add additional emphasis to this, it is the fact that our sin places us in debt, quote-unquote, to the justice of God. God's justice demands that the sinner pay the penalty. It is the mercy of God that we ask for in the person of Jesus Christ to substitute him for us at the point of judgment. Our sin nature began, the sin nature of the human race began with an act of rebellion. Romans chapter 5 says that it was by one man that sin entered into the world and everyone became a sinner in Adam. But since Adam, to just go along with his decision to ratify that decision, as, if, as it were, as a race, we continually commandeer God's creation for our own selfish use. I use the term commandeer. Pir piracy is the kind of the backdrop of that. It's taking what does not belong to you by force and using it for your own ends. And I'm saying that each of us takes our own existence, our life, though it is a gift of God, and we take it by force and use it for our own purposes. That's our situation in sin. And so our sins continue to deepen the debt that we began life with through our willful disobedience as well as our ignorance. Because we offend God in more ways and on more occasions than we are even aware of. That's the psalmist thought when he says, Lord, cleanse me of secret faults. Things that don't even register to my conscience as wrong. You see, that's where we are as human beings. Our nature inclines us towards sin our lives are built around, many times, a sinful habit or a sinful mode of existence. And all of that results in an increase of spiritual responsibility and condemnation before God. But the problem is that not only do we have this debt that continues to grow out of all control... We have nothing with which to pay it. We don't have any of the currency that God accepts. Our good deeds cannot undo our evil deeds. You see, that's the way most people think of it. If I do enough good deeds, then they'll outweigh my evil deeds. The problem is that there isn't even a one-to-one -one correspondence between evil and good. Because every good deed we do is tainted by evil. And so it doesn't really count. But even if it counted on a one-to-one -one basis, what about all the other sins that we've done? But God doesn't count it that way. Good deeds, additionally, cannot undo the rebellion of Adam. They cannot undo who we are. Kind of like the individual who decides they're going to get rid of some vice in their life. And they, what they find over time is they exchange it for another vice. A person who gives up smoking often exchanges it for overeating. And so on and so forth we could go. But the fact of the matter is, even if you took out a vice from your life as an unbeliever and didn't participate in that and didn't add any other vices, you still can't deal with the nature that causes you to sin in the first place. 
That's what the death of Christ does do. We depend upon the mercy of God to dismiss or wipe away that debt. Now, I put those words, dismiss and wipe away, in parentheses, or in uh, quotes, because they are virtual synonyms for forgive. We count on God to forgive our sins. But because we're so used to that word, I wanted to put in something that helps us fill in the idea. We want God to take away the sin, to completely eliminate it. And that's only possible by God's mercy. We can't earn it. In fact, Scripture says we have to see ourselves as morally and spiritually bankrupt. That's the background of the, the expression in Matthew 5, verse 3, which says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who realize they have nothing to commend themselves to God. Everything that is in their life is condemning in its nature. And yet we come to God asking for mercy on the basis not of our good works, but on the basis of the penalty which Jesus Christ paid for us. The substitution that Scripture says God will practice on our behalf as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Because when Christ died on the cross, one of the last things he said was what? It is finished. Paid in full. But that payment in full only applies to those who apply for it, who ask for it, who come to God by faith, repenting of who they are, pleading for mercy, not on the basis of anything they have done, but on the basis of what Christ has accomplished. So it's only through our repentance, which is really a twofold thing, our repentance of being sinners in nature and in practice. Or as I've put it here in the notes, our repentance of being sinners and of our personal sin. That's the only way we can have a share in Christ's body and blood. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who comes to faith in Jesus Christ understands that's the nature of the transaction. I think it needs to be explained to them in just those words, or just not necessarily verbatim, but the idea that you're repenting of who you are, not just what you do, because it is your nature that is the problem. You can perhaps change the particular type of sin that you do, but you can never change the fact that you are a sinner. That's why a seven-step program is never a substitute for salvation. It's always necessary to come to God by faith in repentance. Only God can solve the problem of our sin nature. And take away our desire to continue in that sin. Then we're forgiven. And so the forgiven individual is now obligated by God to forgive lesser debts that others commit against them. And everything that anyone can do against you in the way of sin is less than what you have done against God. It doesn't matter what they've done. And some people think, well, you don't know my situation. But the fact of the matter is that God is forgiving everything, the whole deal, past, present, future. He's forgiving it all and eradicating that sin nature ultimately and practically. Not in this lifetime do we get to see that sin nature eradicated, but rather at glorification. But it's dealt a death blow by the death of Christ on the cross so that we can say, as Romans 6 says, that as Christ died, so I have died to sin, I don't need to continue sinning. 
We've been forgiven an immense debt then. All other debts should seem trivial by comparison. When God has forgiven the debt that would keep you from his presence, any offense that an individual could, compete, could commit against you is far less. This is the parable of the unjust steward where Christ talked about that individual who had such a massive debt he could never hope to pay it. His Lord was going to sell him and his family into slavery until that indebted individual pled for mercy. And his master forgave him. And then he went out and basically wanted to strangle someone for a pittance that they owed him. That is a picture of our unforgiving spirit after having been forgiven so much in salvation. It should be for us a joy to forgive others because of the joy of forgiveness that we have received. Joy in the forgiveness that God has provided should make us as well willing, glad to forgive others. But we don't often, we find that that's difficult sometimes, don't we? There are things people can do against others that are just horrendous. And the world would say unforgivable. But in Christ, there is no such thing. We don't have the luxury of not forgiving. We're not going to get into the text, but if you continue in verses 14 and 15 here, Scripture says, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father... If you forgive your men their trespasses, rather, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not, verse 15, then he will not forgive you. What does that mean? Does that mean he stops forgiving you at the point that you, st- that you forget, don't forgive someone else? Or does that mean that the person who is unforgiving was never saved to begin with? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? I think there are a lot of professing Christians who are hoping the choice is A. And so thinking, well, you know, I I might have to pay a little bit of, you know, just I'm not going to be forgiven from this point on, but I can't forgive that. And you wonder how many of them may be described in, Matthew 7 is saying, Lord, Lord, look at all the things I did in your name. And he says, depart, I never knew you. Sobering thoughts. Forgiveness is required by a forgiven individual. It is by our forgiving others that we declare our forgiven state. It's how we prove to the world that we have been forgiven. We're not talking about salvation by works, but what we are saying is that true salvation works. It evidences its life. And one who has truly been forgiven the debt of sin will be one who forgives others. But a refusal to forgive the lesser debts makes a lie of our claim to have been forgiven in the first place and makes illegitimate our claim to have been forgiven. That's how God looks at it. And it's certainly how we should look at it. So again, as I say, this is perhaps the most difficult part of this prayer because it actually requires something of me. What's happening when I don't want to forgive? I'm holding on to my pride. I'm saying that person needs to pay a price I think it's important to understand that when we forgive, that doesn't say that what the person did was okay. It doesn't justify what they did. It still remains wrong. And I think sometimes when we respond to one another by by saying, it's okay, we're cheapening the whole process. When the person comes in forgiveness... First of all, it should be more than just a simple, I'm sorry. 
I think as the person offended, you have every right to say you're sorry for what? Because they need to confess. They need to say what the offense was. And if the person responds, well, you know, no, inform me. Let's have a conversation here. Oh, you're just not forgiving, are you? I don't think you'll have that response. But if you do, that person isn't really repentant. So does that mean I don't have to forgive then? I can be bitter against someone because they didn't ask for forgiveness. Is that what we're coming up to? No, that, that's not right either. I think the forgiving spirit has to be there just as God is willing to forgive all who will come to him through Christ. So we should have that open door in our minds to forgive anyone if they'll just ask. And in the meanwhile, we have within us that peace that comes from knowing that we're not dwelling on an offense and becoming bitter over it. Then verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is a prayer for protection from sin. It's interesting that this follows right on the heels of the previous request, isn't it? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation. You see, because in that process of forgiving or not forgiving, we're exposed to the possibility of sin. Though the offense was against me, I am the offended party, yet I participate in the sin if I refuse to be forgiving. That's one aspect. But I want to expand it a little broader than that because forgiveness from God is no excuse to continue in sin. And I've gone ahead and put two verses right into your notes so that you can carry them with you and you remember to associate them here. The first is Romans chapter 6, verse 1. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase the reading to make it a little bit more pointed, perhaps. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may overwhelm it? You see, chapter 5 was talking about how grace just comes in and floods the zone. It completely obliterates sin. So great is the grace of God. So what? Are we supposed to continue sinning so that grace has more opportunity to do its job? May it never be. Don't even think that. That's the infamous God forbid. An inaccurate translation. God's not in the statement. It's just a 16th century English phrase put into scripture to express a strong negative. I prefer to just go with something that's a little bit more a direct translation rather than a gloss. So may it never be. That should not even enter into our minds if if we're true believers. That's the thought of an unbeliever. That's really what's being expressed by that negation. And then we have 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9. Whoever is born of God does not practice sin because God's seed dwells in him and he cannot continue sinning because he is born of God. And so the question comes, how long can a person continue sinning and still be born of God? Well, we shouldn't go there. But that is the way our minds work, and if we're caught up in something like that, then again, there's a reason for that. But look at what the Scripture is saying, that a person who knows the Lord truly cannot continue in a known life of sin without being miserable. I like the expression that a child of God can do anything that an unbeliever can do, he just can't enjoy it. The misery index goes up because God's spirit, that's the testimony of David, is it not, in Psalm 51, that while I kept silent, my bones grew weary within me. David is saying, I aged an incredible amount over the last nine months. This fire that was burning of conviction. And the lesson we're supposed to learn from these verses and others we could add to it is that grace does not free us to continue in sin. Some people refer to this concept as cheap grace. Grace that saves you but doesn't require any change. 
I don't call it cheap grace. It's not grace at all. It's fake grace. God's true grace frees us from sin, from the desire to sin. And yes, we can corrupt that work of the Spirit of God in us. And we need to trust God's grace to restore us if we allow ourselves into that kind of a situation. But getting back to the text, the text literally says, lead us not into temptation. So that gives the idea that God can lead us into temptation or out of temptation. Does God tempt us to sin? What's the answer to that? Good, I see some heads shaking. Heard a no. God is not the author of sin or temptation. And perhaps the verse that jumped to your mind was James 1 verse 13. Let uh, no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, because God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. It's a very definitive statement. So what is Christ meaning when he says, lead us not into temptation? Well, I think first of all, I need to state that God is often said in Scripture to do what he only permits to be done. And we could illustrate that. I'm not going to get into that a lot because I want to just simply focus on a couple of other things that I want to present here. And that would be that God has promised to provide a way of escape in every moment of temptation. Every time temptation comes to us, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, there is no temptation overtaken you that is not common to man, that doesn't tempt other people. You're not unique. But God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, your ability to withstand, to fight off that temptation. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you, excuse me, so that you may be able to endure it. God provides us with the means of gaining victory over temptation. Scripture does say that God ordains the testing of our faith. And a key illustration of that would be Abraham and how the famines came and he went to Egypt and then he went to another country, Gerar, I think it was. And in both of these places, he lies and says Sarah is his sister and not his wife. And you know the problems that occur from that. Was God the one who tempted Abraham to sin? No, the test was there. Would you say Abraham failed or passed the test of faith in those two instances? Failed miserably. God graciously restored him and gave him another opportunity, allowed another test to come in. And finally, we see Abraham with his son Isaac, and he passes the ultimate test of his faith. But all of those steps along the way, even those failures, was a part of preparing Abraham for that last test. So it is in our lives, God allows the testing of our faith, what we consider temptation, is an opportunity to grow in faith, to trust God, to give us victory. We don't have to sin. But what happens? We often ignore the way of escape and plunge right into the sin. Why would you say we do that? Why would you say someone else might do that? I don't want to make it too personal. I'd say it's a very, if we're going to be honest, because we like sin. That's the sad truth. But God has provided the way of escape. He always does. So this request, lead us not into temptation, reflects the desire of a true saint to be delivered from evil completely. Knowing our own weakness, we should attempt to avoid even 
temptation which occasions sin. We know what are certain triggers for sin in our lives. Where we can avoid the things that cause us to be overwhelmingly, in our estimation, tempted, we should avoid them. We need to train ourselves in that way. This is as much as what Christ was exhorting Peter to do in Luke twenty-two thirty-two, 32, when he told Peter that he had prayed so that his faith would not fail. And he was exhorting Peter to do the same. Peter's faith did not ultimately fail, but in the moment he failed. When he denied Christ. So the idea of being led into temptation, it's not that God authors the temptation to sin. The word temptation can be used for trial as well. That's how James used it. We're to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations or trials. God leads us into the trial of our faith. We decide whether that's going to result in temptation to sin or a stepping stone for our faith. It's all about what we put into the situation. So God's leading us into temptation is through the means of these trials, the testings that come our way. And then the prayer ends with the words, these are the words of Christ, let me just jump right to here. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you have a translation in front of you that is not the King James translation, you may well not have that last phrase. Anybody's Bible not have that phrase? You got a Bible that doesn't have it? English Standard Version won't have it. NIV won't have it. A lot of versions, not just new, old versions as well do not have it. There's a key reason for that. It's because all of these subsequent translations are trying to cheat us and keep us from the Word of God, right? No, that's not the reason. It's rather the fact that this phrase is not found in the earliest and best manuscripts that weren't even available when the King James translation was produced. See, there's been a lot of discovery of manuscripts since then, especially through the 20th century. So as a result, what translations will do is they will either omit or place this phrase in brackets or in a footnote. How did that get to happen? And who's changing the Word of God? Isn't that an important question? Who is changing the Word of God? Well, It appears from historical evidence that these words were added as a completion of a prayer formula for use in public worship because a prayer ought to end with amen, right? And after all, what we have here is a sort of summary of the entire prayer in these words. Yours is the kingdom. We began with that. Yours is the power and the glory, the worship forever. Amen. So there's nothing unbiblical in this phrasing. We would agree with all of it. And in fact, I'll treat the different aspects of it briefly. But is it changing the word of God to try to go back to what is probably the original reading? Or is it changing the word of God to leave it in? You can make your decision. But you see, that's the kind of decision that a translator faces when they come up against phrases like this that do not have good historical backing. The backing comes from much later in the manuscript preservation line. And so it's very understandable why this phrasing is not in there. Let's back that up, just one more question or a series of of, of thoughts here. If this is not part of the original, then when it was placed in, what was happening? Someone was adding to the word of God. I firmly believe that's what happened, but I believe it might have been inadvertent. 
that, no, that someone didn't really mean to change it. Why? Because notes were often included in the margins. And after a note was in the margin, people wondered, was that something that was accidentally left out of the text? And so sometimes those marginal notes got put into the text. It's understandable. I'm not judging that person, but I certainly think it's unfair to say that translations following the King James Version have tried to omit this phrase and rip it out of the Word of God, though it belongs there. I really question whether it belongs there. But in either case, the Word of God is not damaged by its inclusion, though I would certainly agree with the idea of putting it in brackets or putting it in a footnote. I think there is reason to go with that decision. I'm trying to be faithful to what I can be sure was the Word of God. No doctrine is changed by this. But I want a pure text. That's my desire. When Scripture here says, your kingdom come, the fact of the matter is that God's kingdom is eternally His. Your kingdom come was in the earlier part, uh, but yours is the kingdom here in this phrase. God's is the kingdom. No vote or permission needs to be sought. God's kingdom is and always will be. He reigns right now in spite of man's best efforts to the contrary. And yes... I think that Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. They say we're going to get rid of of God and his anointed one, the Messiah. I think that happens in the capital at Harrisburg as well as in Washington, D.C. and throughout the 50 several states, as well as countries around the world. When man's laws are made to trump God's laws, He reigns. Isaiah 50 verse 14 expresses God's viewpoint this way. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the aisles as a very little thing. The nations of the world are as a drop of a bucket. The idea is someone who's getting their water supply from a spring or a well, and they dip their bucket in and fill it up, and as they're walking home, a drop or several drops fall from the outside of the bucket onto the ground. Who worries about that? Or the idea is that you have a goldsmith, And he's going to weigh out the gold. And though he puffs a puff of air on the balance, there's still a film of dust as he weighs the gold. Or maybe there's a film of dust on the gold. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the weight. That's what God's saying about the nations of the world. And I like to put it this way, the united nations of the world, all together with all of their power, all of their technology, all of their armies to God are so insignificant. They're like the the drop that fell from the outside of the bucket that doesn't affect at all what's left in the bucket. God's not affected by the nations. That's why when Christ comes in the second coming, it's just the sword that goes from his mouth that destroys the armies of the world. He doesn't even have to lift a finger. Such is the power of our God. His kingdom cannot be overthrown. Daniel 2 verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the kings of the various empires that have been described earlier in the chapter, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed... And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's God's statement regarding his kingdom. His is also the power. He has all the power necessary to accomplish all his holy will. That is a good and precise definition for the omnipotence of God. 
to just simply say that means all powerful, that God can do anything, misses the mark. He has all the power necessary to accomplish all his holy will. He does not have the power, want the power, need the power to sin. But he has all the power to do anything and everything he wants to be done in his holy plan, and he will not be thwarted. We can't add to God's power. We're not asking God to have more power. We're not rendering power to him in some way. We're simply acknowledging the fact that he has this kind of power, and that affects how I should think and how I should live. His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. This concept of glory in previous studies we've linked to the worship of God. He will be worshipped forever. Glory is the outshining of the perfections of God. Of all that God is, it's what we could just describe in glowing terms about how great and good God is. We give him glory by praising him, about, by talking well of God. And scripture defines praise as worship. So that's why I say the summation of this point, yours is the glory forever, that God will be worshipped forever. We will constantly, and the angels will constantly be declaring the goodness and greatness of God throughout eternity. And this wraps up the prayer that we have, the word amen, meaning so be it, let it be. Prayer is a unique treasure that we've been given, an opportunity to solicit the intervention of God himself in the affairs of men. By prayer, it is God's design that we declare our dependence on him, that we need his intervention, that what needs to be done is beyond our power. Only God can fill the longing that is in our heart, the worship. Only the worship of God can fill that need within us. We have a need to worship God. And we, only find, we will only find satisfaction when we do worship God that way. And so it is that to sum up the entirety of the teaching here, let's just say it this way, that prayer from a godly heart has God's full attention. Isn't that an amazing thought? Prayer from a godly heart has God's full attention. He doesn't miss it. He's not busy. He hears. He answers. This is why we pray. It's not just about the needs. God knows what they are. It's about our worshiping God. So let's pray and ask God to instill in us more and more that desire to worship. Lord, we do thank you for your word. This short model prayer that is packed with so much meaning. Lord, may we meditate on these words and on the concepts introduced by these words. And truly allow our communication with you to be changed by what we see here, that your kingdom would be of primary importance, that it would fill our minds and our hearts more so than the political conjectures of our age. Your kingdom is the only eternal kingdom, and it is our privilege to have a part in it. May we live out your purpose for our lives here on this earth and by so doing be a beacon of light and hope to those around us. Use our worship to prepare us to be good witnesses. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.